Hello, and welcome to our webinar, uh, Persuading People Through the Power of Data. I am Michelle Donovan, and I am the Analytics Director here at Best Friends, and I am joined today by Maureen Gillespie, who is one of our data scientists, and Whitney Bollinger, who is our Director of Strategy and Network Operations. So we're going to talk to you today all about uh, how we use data to tell stories and get buy-in for the, the initiatives that you are needing. So today we're going to talk about basically three things. The first one is how to tell that data story. And a really important piece of this is how to evaluate your audience. And then based on those two things, how you compel action with your data. The most important thing about using data and having data is being able to make decisions and, and plans and actions based on that data. And so um, that's what we're going to be talking about today. So the first thing I want to tell you about before I pass it on to these uh, other lovely ladies is how do you identify the story that you need to tell? And the very first thing that I really want to impress on you is just pick one. We know that your lives in shelters and in rescues across the United States are complicated. You have lots going on. You have so many good stories you could tell, stories of heartbreak and stories of triumph. We really wanna focus on one though, because that really helps us to make sure that we aren't splitting focus and that we can come back to that same theme um, or variations on that same thing over and over again. So focus on the one story that you're gonna to wanna to tell. And the next thing about that is um, repetition. So the, the reality is, is that you're not gonna come up with something creative or something new every single time. It's okay to repeat. In fact, it takes a long time and many, many iterations of, of repeating the same concept before it really sinks in, before people can remember what you said. And so don't shy away from using a, a specific keyword or a specific phrase or sentence or coming back to the same idea over and over again. That's really gonna help your audience to take away the main point, whatever story it is that you chose. <clears throat> the other thing is that in telling a data story, you don't necessarily need to have slides, but if you do, really focus on keeping them simple. You don't want them to distract from the story that you're telling. You want them to augment and supplement what you're what you're going for. And similarly, because you don't always have an opportunity to give a slideshow or to give a full presentation, you can think about a data visualization being a story in itself and really capitalizing on on all of the different aspects of one really solid data visualization to, to explore whatever the point is that you need to make to whatever audience you need to make that, that point to. So things like making really good use of the title space, instead of just saying, here's, here's how these two things happen, you can be very specific. As we've increased our return to field, we've noticed a decrease in the number of euthanasias. Whatever it is, you know, whatever that takeaway is, you can be really clever in, in how you bring that in. And um, and then you can show us that that conflict and resolution or whatever that desired resolution is through through your your data visualizations. You can really support it with data. So how do you tell this story then, right? So that's the kind of the framework, some some things that you want to think about, but the actual story, and these are the things that we're going to be touching on throughout today. The first one is the setting. So this is the context. Um, you know, when we think about setting, you go back to, you know, your, your grade school English class or language arts or whatever it was when you're learning about how to construct a story, you start with the setting. So you make sure that you understand whatever the context is, the background, the history, how you got here. So you may have already said it a million times, but the audience that you're speaking to may have never heard it before, or they've only heard it once and it was a very long time ago. So this is your opportunity to help set the scene for, for why whatever you're about to talk about is important and, and meaningful and noteworthy. The next one is to pick a main character. So in shelters, we have incredible characters, right? We have all these wonderful animals at our disposal, but don't forget about the community member who can be really impactful too, or maybe even a shelter employee or a volunteer that's that's really helping to advance whatever the program is that you're working on. So pick one. Again, you don't want to, you could have, you know, occasionally you could find more than one, but generally it's going to be really helpful to be very focused on one specific main character that you're going to tell this story through through their lens. 
Um, picking a main character also helps to build familiarity and liking, and this is an opportunity to pull on those heartstrings. So when we talk about data, we oftentimes think about just the very cerebral, the very, the very logical, rational, you know, science-driven type of work, and that's all very important, and, and we believe in that fully. But there's something to be said for really attracting attention on both ends of that spectrum and making sure that that you that you're personalizing it and that you're really bringing it home that it's not just about a bunch of statistics it's about an individual animal it's about an individual caretaker whoever that is and that's that's where the main character comes in and really gives you that opportunity the balance and the imbalance are um you know, that's that's what makes a story a story. So you start out by identifying where is this conflict? What is the, this is essential to storytelling. Your audience wants to resolve that conflict. So you can use data to demonstrate that there is an imbalance and, and give it that, that credibility and that objectivity, but then also think about and, and explore the opportunities to balance that and to alleviate whatever concerns are being caused by that imbalance. Um, you can also talk about the risks of not balancing these things. And your audience really wants to reduce the tension. And so when you give them an option, when you give them what the balance is, and especially a very tactical solution, they're going to be bought in. That's human nature that they really want to fix whatever is the problem. And so you get to that solution um, and um, you know you can you can think of that solution in terms of uh, what what specifically do you do to make it happen, but then also coming around to the data. And what is what 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 can you use data? you you had a, a baseline in the imbalance where you show that there was something that needed to be fixed. And then once you look at the solution, you can also use data to demonstrate the impact or the progress that that, that solution is making. And then in the end, you want to call to action. So you've identified what a solution is, but maybe your audience isn't the ones that are actually implementing that solution. So what do you want from this audience? A lot of times in, in sheltering and animal welfare, adopt, foster, donate, volunteer, sign a petition. All of those things are really good, but there might be something really specific. And, and so think about your specific audience. So with that background about the storytelling and, and what to do with the story, I'm going to pass it over to Whitney to talk about the different specific audiences. Great. Thank you so much, Michelle. So there's a lot of different audiences that you probably speak to on a daily basis, and it's very important that you take the time to tailor your message to the specific audience in the way that you're trying to reach with your specific message or your specific story. So there's definitely going to be overlap depending on who you're talking with. We've picked out a few common audiences, supporters, funders, leaders, and the media. And there is a lot of overlap here, but there's some things that you should be thinking of when you're developing a story for it, one of these specific audiences. First of all, supporters. We recommend that with supporters, you really lead with heart. You want to follow up and support it with the data, but as Michelle said, it's very important to tie in the heart and the emotional comp to compel uh, compel the audience um, with the story. And the data can help you in supporting that. And we'll have some examples of that later in the webinar. You also, when you're thinking of supporters, you can be thinking of donors, volunteers, members of your community. So that could be potential adopters, potential fosters. That's all going to fall within that supporters umbrella. Then you have funders. Funders include organizations like Best Friends or other national organizations or lo even local grant funders. And you really want to marry data with the heart and the story, heart, um, the heart grabbing story here. But it can be different for every type of funder. If you're working with an animal welfare funder, they're more likely to want to hear a success story or a happy tale and have some of that heartstring uh, component in the story that you're giving them in your reports or in your initial application. But if you're working with a public health group, for example, you are probably gonna wanna stick more to data or try to focus on a human-based story that is supported with your organization's grant application and your organizational data. Then you have leaders. So whether it's your city leaders, your city councils, your um, county government um, leaders, your uh, board of directors, 
they're um, going to be very interested in the data, but also don't forget the heart. They're people too. And even if they are not heavily involved in your animal organization, that doesn't mean that they aren't going to be compelled by the heartwarming stories. And it can be really helpful to talk in terms of how a larger community is going to be impacted, whether that's your city, your county, your state, that can help uh, them tie your story in with their larger goals. And then the media, always start with facts that you wanna look at qualitative and quantitative data with the media. So that's numbers and also, and a, uh, stories and uh, opinions and some, some things like that. Um, we'll talk more about that. You really want to try to grab their attention and a human interest component is a great way to do it, but they also really like to have numbers so that they can demonstrate changes over time, impact, and bring it home for those readers or followers that may be more data focused. So now I'm going to hand it over to Maureen. She's going to start us on our first example story. Thanks so much, Whit. Um, so I'm going to discuss uh, how to identify some data that would be helpful for advocating for increased support for an improved return to owner practice at a shelter. So let me set the scene and introduce you to a city shelter that's taking in about 10,000 dogs every year. And as much as they'd like to be, they're just not quite at a 90% save rate. But they're really close and they really want to get there. The shelter takes in a lot of strays and a lot of lost dogs and relies really heavily on transfers out and adoptions for their live outcomes. So this is setting the scene of this shelter. So to identify imbalances within this shelter, the shelter really needs to identify that what might be holding them back from reaching that 90% save rate goal for dogs. It's important to use data to confirm your intuitions and hunches about your shelter. So for this shelter, they really need to confirm that they do have the high adoption rate and transfer rates that they think that they do, and that their save rate is close to 90%, again, like they think that they are. And then the shelter needs to compare their shelter to other similar shelters that have really similar characteristics to show that return to owner rates are low in this particular shelter. And that could really be the, um, the opportunity for improvement. So Shelter Pet Data Alliance makes it pretty easy to do this, both the identifying of um, any sort of uh, general baselines for the shelter and to do that comparison. And there's no math involved. So using the Shelter Pet Data Alliance, a tool, in the first step, um, you can select the shelter that you're working with. So we'll select this uh, shelter that's taking in 10,000 dogs um, per year. And um, there's a drop down list and it can be filtered by the first letter and it shows state and EIN to confirm it's actually your shelter because there's a lot of shelters with very similar names. Then in the second step, we start to filter to create a comparison group. So we have a lot of different filters and I'm just gonna walk you through them. The first thing we can do is filter on species. Since we're looking at return to owner for this group, we're gonna focus on dogs specifically because this is a very common out live outcome for dogs. And we know that there are local and regional differences. So you can choose one or multiple states to compare to. For our comparison, I decided to look at three neighboring states that have similar patterns and function quite similarly at the government level. The organization we discussed is government funded, so I decided to select only animal shelters with government contracts and government animal services in organization type. And I also decided to filter for just organizations with a similar intake range to my organization. When I'm doing this um, with any shelter, I like to put a buffer on either side of my intake to make sure I have a good range of organizations that come out in the filter. But you can definitely play around with that range to make sure you have a good sample of shelters in your filtered comparison group. Um, so for a large organization like this, I only included shelters that were taking in 5,000 um, dogs or more per, per year. You may consider um, filtering on save rate as well. Maybe you only want to look for shelters with high save rates to see what they're doing and see how you might compare. 
or maybe you're an organization that looks to help out shelters that are struggling and you want to identify shelters with lower save rates so you can partner with them and maybe set up a transfer. There's lots of options here. But for the purpose of identifying similar organizations for return to owner comparisons, I just left save rate to the full range. Finally, we can take a look at some human population characteristics because shelters exist in communities and we need to understand the human population as well. So um, the urban rural classification comes straight from the census data um, about each county in the United States. And you can um, hover over the eye bubble on um, any of these uh, classifications so you can see where your shelter is classified. So you can see if you're urban or rural or moderately urban. Social Vulnerability Index is a center for disease control measure that looks at how vulnerable a community is to natural and human caused disasters. And our research has shown that where humans are vulnerable, pets are also vulnerable. So again, if you hover over the eye bubble, you can see your social vulnerability index of your community as well. And so here we see that the shelters um, community is heavily urban and it is um, moderately vulnerable. So I chose to compare to shelters in other moderately or highly urban areas and moderately or highly vulnerable communities. And that left me with 35 organizations um, that fit those, fit those filtered criteria. Okay, so here's the output that comes out of SPDA's One Alliance feature. Our sample shelter is shown in black, so they're the black dots, and the aggregate of the comparison shelters is shown in blue. So let's walk through what we can confirm. So if we look at um, this shelter's data, we can confirm that adoption rates are relatively high and similar to other shelters like them in the area. We can also confirm that they do have a high transfer rate. They're making a lot of their live outcomes through transfers, um, even higher than the um, filtered group. And we can also um, confirm that the shelter is close to um, that no-kill benchmark of 90%. So they are doing as well as they thought they were, but they still wanna get over that 90% um, uh, line. So where are those imbalances? So where we see the imbalance is where dogs returning home. Stray, rate, stray um, intake rate is pretty similar to the other um, filtered shelters, but the return to owner rate is lower. The return to owner rate for this shelter is 6% versus 15% for the other filtered shelters like them. So this is that um, example of a place where there's an imbalance and that there's room for improvement. So I'm gonna hand it over to Wit to have her tell you a bit more about how to use this data to create solutions, take action and persuade audiences. Thank you, Maureen. So the Best Friends Network has a wealth of knowledge and resources that are here to help you to address any imbalances that you're finding through One Alliance or any of your other data analysis. For our return to home example here, we've got some really marvelous playbooks that have been put together and are updated on a, you know, a continual basis by our, a variety of our programs team members. Um, and so I've linked those here on the slide. Uh, they're also available at network.bestfriends.org. And those playbooks are really going to help you walk through all of your programs and see what you can be doing to boost return to owner and return to home rates and to build out that programming. Some examples of the things that get focused on in these playbooks are things like equipping your animal control officers with scanners so that they can focus on reuniting pets in the field before they leave the scene once they've found an animal. Um, they include things like working with utility companies to try to track down missing um, and incorrect microchip information, uh, exploring foster finder programs so that you can keep found pets in the neighborhood where they were picked up, and using pet, uh, platforms like Petco Love Lost and other resources that help reunite animals through the power of the internet. It also can help you um, with preventing lost pets, so talks um, about the distribution of educational materials in your community, holding microchip clinics, clinics and engaging volunteers. Next slide, Marie. Great, thank you. So now we're going to talk through a story that can be um, that this example shelter could tell to a variety of audiences. So the first goal is going to be to identify a main character, and 
this is the kind of story that gets told fairly often in animal welfare and it gets a lot of media coverage and a lot of community traction and you've probably seen it you may have even done it with your own shelter highlighting some type of case of a dog that or a cat that was in um uh, was picked up brought into your shelter and then may have been reunited with their owner after 300 500 600 days those are great stories but you also can't time those stories and if you really want to be talking about return to owner and return to home now remember that even if an animal has been reunited after being uh, missing for two hours, two weeks, two months, those stories are still really heartwarming because the community and the pet owners can put themselves in that position and think about the time that they accidentally left their front door open and their pet ran out and they can put their themselves in the shoes of the person in your story. So um, you really want to start with heart when you're telling these stories, especially when you're talking to your supporters. So we used an example here that Buddy was reunited after 512 days of being missing. Again, it could be five hours. You may get a great photo of a reunion, great video of a reunion where the people and the pets are so happy. It doesn't really matter how long they've been apart. It's just so moving to see them being reunited. And so don't overlook those stories just because the, the days or the time uh, hasn't been an extremely long, oh, extremely long amount of time. You want to make sure that you're supporting your story with the numbers. So as Maureen was pointing out, this organization has a 6% return to owner rate and similar organizations have a 15% return to owner rate. So they can talk about how they are looking to increase their return to owner rate in their community to 15% to be comparable to other similar shelters and that that would help them reunite 1,000 more dogs next year. That's a really great tangible round number that the community can get behind. And then spe share specific calls to action. And as Michelle mentioned earlier, you really want to focus on one specific call to action. There are lots of ways that people can help, but the more focused you are, the more likely you are to get people to move in the direction that you're looking for. So that call to action could look like donations to support uh, low cost uh, microchipping clinics or to fund microchip scanners for ACOs in their vehicles. It could look like volunteering and that might be to moderate Facebook or next door pages to uh, support the microchip clinics to do um, customer service and greeting and line management and all the things that go into those events um, or to block walk and hang out found pet signs. These are all great ways that you could get your community engaged. And remember, you're starting with the heart, you're supporting with the numbers, and then you're ending with one really solid call to action. Next slide. So your call to action for officials is going to be a little bit different. In this situation, we would recommend starting with your data. So talking about how returning more lost dogs means uh, that you will be not only reducing the cost because of reduced length of stay, but also that you are going to be more likely to achieve no kill and that the community supports no kill efforts. And Best Friends has some great data around that that's available to you. Then consider what is your ask? Again, it's a call to action for your officials. You wanna be very specific. Is it that you want funding for a low-cost microchip clinic? Is it that you want funding for the microchip scanners for your ACOs? Is it that you want to replace your pet registration and licensing program with a microchip requirement? Do you want to start a foster finders program and you really need your municipality or your board of directors blessing to do that? Um, you might need to look at ordinances, things like that. Uh, do you want to get GIS support from um, some other department in your municipality to create heat maps of stray uh, animals and where they're found and where they're picked up so that you can target education? That's a really great advanced tool uh, and strategy if you have those resources. And then remind them what the impact is going to be. That not only are you going to save more lives, that your goal is to save a thousand more lives, which will also help to uh, save them funding because you're getting animals home before they ever come into the building, but remind them that 
good PR is good for everybody. It drives votes, it drives donations, it drives community goodwill. And so, you know, Buddy's story, that that start with heart story that we use for supporters would be a great thing to end end on with your with your officials. And remember also that the community's perception is important and returning to owner, especially return to owner in the field is a great way to build that trust with your community and get away from that outdated image of dog catchers and towards a more modern image and more accurate image of a community partner. Okay, next slide. Call to action for the media. Start with your facts. Say you are close to no kill, that you have a great and very successful rescue network, and you're going to have numbers from One Alliance that are going to help you support both of these things. And that RT, an RTO program is a key opportunity and tell them why. Getting back to that, your RTO rate right now is at 6%. Similar shelters are at 15%. And that by meeting them at that 15% level, you could save a thousand more dogs a year and then let them know what you need to do that. Highlight a human interest story. The media loves facts. They love numbers, but they love a good human interest story. So if you can share Buddy's story, share photos of Buddy, share video of Buddy being reunited, if Buddy's owners are willing, potentially set up an opportunity for media to do an interview with Buddy and his owners and talk about their experience. Um, these are all really good things that can help them to tell your story from a visual perspective as well. And then drive home that call to action again, telling the public what specifically you need to increase your RTOs, make it very simple that they, you know, can donate here at this specific link, that they can sign up to volunteer here at this link. Um, and the more specific you can be, the better. Don't tell them just to go to your website. Make sure and tell them what the URL for your website is as well. Okay, and now we're going to go back to Maureen to talk about our next story, which is TNVR and community cat programming. Great, thanks, Lit. So now we have the cat's turn. Um, and what I'd like to do is let's walk how um, walk through how you might use data to make a compelling case for um, establishing a TNVR and community cat program in your community. Okay, so let's set the scene again. This is a shelter that takes in about 3,000 cats per year, and the stray intake is very high, um, and they're really struggling to save cats. And there's no TNVR or community cat programming in their community, and city officials are pretty skeptical about the practice. So how can a shelter use data to um, start arguing for a TNVR program? All right. So again, to kind of identify the imbalance, we're gonna do that confirm and compare. So what data do we need to argue for this TNVR program? First, we need to confirm that this shelter's stray cat intake is really high um, and that other live outcomes like returning to home um, or adoptions or transfers are just not keeping pace with the intake that they have. We also wanna compare the shelter's um, cat save rate to similar shelters to see how it's doing and prove that there really is a need. We also wanna find some evidence of TNVR programming working in another shelter in a similar community to really make it convincing. Okay, so I'm gonna walk through this a lot quicker than last time, um, just looking at, this is the One Alliance tool again in S, uh, Shelter Pet Data Alliance. So we can select our shelter and then we can start making a filtering um, of comparison organizations. So here, cause we're talking about TNVR, we're just gonna filter it to cat data. And for this particular shelter, um, we looked at shelters within the local area, which were four neighboring states in the southeast that are likely to have about the same weather patterns and going to be hit by kitten season at the same time. The shelters um, that we also filtered, uh, we're going to look at shelters of that organization's specific organ um, type, which was government animal services. And we wanted to restrict it to relatively large shelters like the organization that we're working with. I limited the shelters to relatively high um, cat save rates to ensure I was comparing to shelters that had a lot of cat life-saving success because that's the goal of this shelter, right? To move to that successful cat life-saving. And I filtered to shelters with the same urban-rural distinction and social vulnerability 
as my shelter so that I could say that yes, TNVR is working in communities like this shelter. And so while doing that um, filtering, we ended up with 27 organizations that could be compared. Okay. So here's the output from um, that filtering. So again, remember that the shelter that we're talking about is in black and the shelter, um, the other uh, shelters that we filtered to are shown in blue. So we can show that cat adoptions are on par with um, similar shelters. So this shelter is doing really well with cat adoptions. We can also see that the stray intake here is really high compared to other shelters. Their intake, um, their stray cat intake is 90% of their intake um, versus 65% in similar shelters. And here's where we see that imbalance. Um, the return to field rate for this particular shelter is 0% versus 10%, which isn't huge, but 10% in the other filtered organizations. So the comparison shelters are returning 10% of their intake to the field, but the shelter is not doing it at all. So beyond comparing to aggregates, oh, sorry, and the save rate is also low. So beyond comparing to aggregates, um, SPDA also allows you to compare to individual shelters as well you get a list of the comparison filtered shelters and you can order them by different um, variables like intake or outcome types. It took a little digging, but I looked at the shelters with high return to field rates and found a shelter that introduced our uh, return to field in 2020. So 15 to 34% of their outcomes for cats were returned to field between 2020 and 2022. Then I looked at shelters um, at that shelter's save rate. And you can see how well they pattern together. Prior to 2019, they were saving only around 10% of their cats. But in 2019, they made a commitment to saving more cats' lives. By 2020, they were on the verge of no-kill with the introduction of that return to field program and maintained no-kill status in 2021 and in 2022. And you can also see that intake decreased dramatically in 2029. While intake has slightly increased since then, it's still at only a third of the level as it was prior to the introduction of the TNVR program. So this is the evidence. This shelter can show that it needs TNVR by comparing it to other shelters. And then it was also able to identify a shelter that had a TNVR success story. And that shelter was in a similar demographic, similar area as the one as the shelter that really was wanting to argue for their TNVR program. Thanks, Maureen. And again, with that imbalance, uh, the imbalance here being community cap programs, uh, you can use the resources from the Best Friends Network to help you address some of those gaps and build out programming to support uh, and, and close that gap. So our community cap programs handbook, our community cap programs training playbook, these are both uh, available on our website, network.bestfriends.org, or through these links, and they're extremely popular. Every year at the conference, we print out uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of bound copies of the Community Cat Programs Handbook, as well as many other handbooks, and that one is the first one to go. It, it goes like hotcakes, so it's updated regularly. It's very valuable. It's going to cover a lot of questions on everything from how to start a TNVR program to how to build and, um, and grow programs that are existing. We also have Protecting the Community Cats Action page. This is put together by our legislation and advocacy team, and specifically the grassroots advocacy team. And it has a lot of really great tools about how to talk to people in your community, how to talk to local stakeholders and decision makers about community cat programs and address their concerns to get them on board. So it's a great resource for exactly what this example shelter is trying to do. Next slide. So. We talked in the first example about our main character. It was a dog and a cat, or a dog and a human that had been reunited. Here, we're going to talk through an example where the main character is actually Shelter X. It's this shelter that we're looking to mimic. And there's a lot of different ways you can tell these stories. You can focus on a community cat. You can focus 
on a local business owner that supports community cat programs and uses relies on those animals to help with green pest control. You can focus on local uh, cat volunteers. There's a lot of different ways to tell the story, but in this specific example, we're going to do it as kind of a case study where we're going to look at the main character being Shelter X, the group that um, has uh, gone from saving 10% of its cats to 90% in less than three years by using a community cat program. So for, again, for your supporters, you wanna start with the heart. So telling Shelter X's story, you wanna explain that they were struggling with cat life saving just like your shelter is struggling with cat life saving, and that after they introduced their return to field program in 2020, that their save rate doubled and that now they're no kill. That is very powerful, and you can really show your supporters that it's feasible. It takes a lot of the doubt and uh, concern out of, well, is it really gonna impact us the way it's impacted other groups? Well, you can talk about how this organization is similar to your organization. You may even be able to reach out to that organization and see if they can share uh, some quotes, some uh, photos, some specific stories of cats that were helped through their program to help drive home that heartwarming story. You're gonna wanna support it with numbers. So letting them know that you're only saving 45% of your cats right now and that uh, over 90% of the cats coming into your organization are strays and that you know that the way to improve that, the data proves it, research and industry best practices prove that it's a TMVR and RTF program. And then again, you wanna share specific calls to action that are going to get you, get them to support your cause. Are you going to have to address a, a local ordinance? Maybe you need them to speak with their elected officials, their city council members to help get support for that. Um, are you wor worried about staffing for this new program or for uh, TNR clinics? Then maybe you need to be asking them to volunteer and specifically to volunteer in your clinic. Or you might need funding to help support uh, the surgeries themselves to support a new position, a new van, traps, whatever it may be. So ask specifically for donations and tie it back to that heartwarming story. Okay. For officials, you're going to want to start with data. We, if you've worked in animal welfare for any length of time and you've worked with uh, local communities and officials around cats, you know that they're likely to hear complaints about, about cats, but we also know that there are a lot of benefits to TNVR that uh, not only help with life-saving, but it helps with how the cats interact with the community. And so we need to be informing your officials of, and your leaders of those things. So starting with data, you want to explain that TNB, TNR and TNVR is the only humane successful method for controlling community cat populations. There are a lot of resources through Best Friends, through felineresearch.org. Um, there's a lot of great research out there that will talk about the vacuum effect and it'll help you explain to them exactly why this program is the program that is going to make a difference in your community. Talk about how your cat save rate is 45% that 90% of them are coming in as strays and that shelters uh, in your area with similar demographics save over 80% of their cats. And then show the example of Shelter X as a specific case study to show what they've done. Again, if you can connect with Shelter X and find out specifically what programs they, uh, they launched, how they went about it, and how they got buy from their officials, get um, information and connect the, their local officials or their board of directors with your own. Those can be really great strategies to get people on board. Make sure you know what your ask is. Are you looking to update a city ordinance? Are you looking for funding? Are you really just looking for their support so that they know when they have a constituent that comes to them and is concerned about cats yowling or fighting in their yard, that they are equipped with talking points and can explain that TMVR is actually going to help 
address those concerns as well as improve life saving in their community. And then you wanna make sure that you are tying all of this back to an impact that they, are under, they understand that a TMVR a return to field program, um, if you did an RTF program of 10%, that you would save a hundred more cats a year. It's a very, again, a round tangible number that people can understand and really put their, their minds around. That TMVR is going to reduce stray intake, which means over time, it's going to reduce the resources needed to care for stray cats and allow you to focus on other populations of animals or higher need animals. And, and you can talk about how Shelter X cut its cat intake by 33%. And the TMBR also addresses the community's needs. So again, talking about how the a TMBR program and a well-run community cat program can address the nuisance behaviors that citizens often complain to their local uh, their local elected officials about. And, you know, I have one of the fav my favorite things I've ever heard about community cat programs, it was back um, when I first got into animal welfare and we I worked in an organization with a big feral cat program. Our trap our head trapper used to always say that community cats are something that whether you love cats or, or, or are very annoyed by cats, you can get behind because it's going to be beneficial for you either way. So make sure and tell that story to your officials and, and back that up with your data. Okay, next slide. Okay, and then with the media. So again, starting with facts, talking about how TNR is the only successful method of humane population control, talking about the 45% cat save rate that your organization has and that 90% are coming in as strays. Again, talking about how similar shelters in the area are saving 80% and then how uh, Shelter X has been successful and in three years has helped to itself achieve no kill through the use of a community camp program. Maybe you are able to set up an interview with a community cat trapper that works with Shelter X or with the Shelter X leadership. Maybe they'd like to be involved and help and help you and speak with the media about their program and their success to help the community really put those pieces together. Highlight a human interest story to drive home your story. Can they talk with a community cat caretaker that's feeling overwhelmed and that is really invested in the cats in her area, but is really needing the help of a TMVR and RTF program because she is paying out of pocket to have these animals be neutered? or maybe an individual community member that's struggling with nuisance behaviors. That could be a good way to talk about how community cat programming can help people that are struggling with the problems and the negative sides of cat populations, as well as those that are really interested in saving as many lives as possible. And then can you tell the story of a cat in your shelter? Is there a cat that um, has come in that would have really benefited from a RTF program that you can highlight and show how their quality of life would have been better and they may have had, a, well, they wouldn't have had such a long length of stay if they had the benefit of an RTF program. Those are just a few different examples of ways that you can tie in human interest and a heartstring story to your media pitch. And then make sure you're driving home your call to action. Is it calling elected officials? Is it donating? Is it volunteering? Is it um, tra helping, learning how to trap? What is the specific need that you are asking for? And then to help you out, we've also put together some resources that um, are designed to help you tell your data stories. So first, just a reminder where to find data. You can come in to SPDA, Shelter Pet Data Alliance, and want, use the One Alliance tool to find data. If you need additional or supplementary data, there are things like public record requests, Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA requests to get additional data. The Census Bureau has excellent data uh, available online that can help you really round out uh, your story and drive it home. We've put together a social media template that you can use to help 
um, drive home the need for a community cat program. If that is a story you're interested in telling, it's a Canva template that's linked here so that you can edit the numbers, you can edit the language and make sure that it's serving your story, um, including what your, what is your call to action. In the example that we've got here on the slide, it's to ask your city council member to support the community cat program. You'll be able to edit that. Feel free to use that, put your logo on it and share it out to your community. We've also put together a press release template around return to home and return to owner programs. So that is a good stepping point if you're wanting to educate your community about RTO and RTH and how they can help to make that impact and tell, um, tell your buddy story, tell the show your data from One Alliance, and then make sure that you have your one clear call to action. And then we also offer meetings directly with the wonderful Maureen, who's walked you through One Alliance here today. And you can walk with her through your data, through Shelter Pet Data Alliance and One Alliance. And she can help you to parse out insights and imbalances and kind of help to guide you on your journey as you look to, uh, to solve imbalances and, and figure out what data stories you want to start with. And then we also, uh, oh, and that link uh, here in the presentation will allow you to sign up for a specific time to meet with her. She's helped dozens of network partners already, and she would really love to help you. And then we also wanted to remind you there's some great free online tools out there, things like Canva, which is a free graphic design platform that helps make sure that your graphics, whether it's for social media or presentations, or you're, you're looking to put together a flyer for your community, that they're all consistent and that they're branded and that they look really slick. And then Flourish is a free platform that helps you to do data visualizations if you want to do really specific uh, data-based slides. Well, thank you so much, Maureen and Whitney, for sharing all of your uh, firsthand knowledge and experience with how to pull the data and, you know, how to really make that data persuasive and that, that storyline persuasive to a variety of audiences. So I hope everybody watching has learned about how to tell a data story, how to evaluate your audience, and to really compel action using data. So thank you so much for your time, and uh, we'll see you around. Thank you all.